Time is up. Please hand your quizzes in towards the end of each show. Time is up. Please hand your quizzes in. No more writing. Either end of the row. Hand your quizzes in. Quizzes, quizzes, quizzes. That's it. Quiz, quizzes, quizzes. Time is up, time is up. Are those quizzes? Okay. What? They took the quiz. Okay, they might have had to do Quizzes are... Any more quizzes? What is the fair price? No, that's not a fair price. We've talked about it a hundred times. Go back and review your notes. Right? Okay, folks. Enough discussion about the quiz. The usual rules apply. Quizzes will get graded. I will get an email saying the quizzes are graded. Come and pick them up. Okay? I won't put the solution up. I won't put the solution up till, ev till everybody get their, gets their quizzes back. Okay. Enough. Okay. Don't talk about the quiz. It's done. Okay. So what's a fair price? Fair, what's the only price at which you're indifferent between selling and not selling back? when everybody gets an equal share of the spoils, right? Any other price, think about it. Any other price you can show by definition is not fair. What if I could buy back at the old price? Is that fair? Why isn't it fair? Because the people who sell their shares back will get none of the premium, you'll get all of the premium, so you would not sell it back. If I paid them too high a price, you're not going to essentially hold on, you're going to every... So the only price at which it's fair is if everybody gets that same price increase. Which means the increase in value for your firm is whatever the price per share increase was times what? The total number of shares outstanding. Not the remaining shares, but the total shares. Because the minute you put in the remaining shares, you know what you're telling me, we get all the spoils, they get nothing. So that's, that's the re that was the only part of this quiz that was actually required you to think through what it meant. Yeah. No, 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 the fair price is already a premium over the actual price. You're not getting it at the old price. Right, I understand that, but as an investor, it gives me an extra effort. You know how absurd what you said sounds? In practice, you should pay more than, oh, what, then how is it fair? Well, it takes you more effort to sell off your shares. What effort does it take to sell your shares? You click a button. It takes you less effort to sell your shares than to hold on to the shares and pay taxes on them. There's no effort involved, nothing. 
This is in the 1800s where you have to take the shares and ride, or no, get on a horse and gallop across the country. It's electronic. You want to sell the shares? You hit a button. In fact, you said get an email. Accept, don't accept. Buy, don't sell. There's, there's nothing that requires any work and you are, you are getting a premium over the old price. You might not like the premium and if you don't like the premium, what should you do? Don't sell back. That's the power you have. Nobody forces you to sell. And if you don't like the price, you think it's too low, don't sell it back. Then you won't move at all. So don't move. So be, be the donkey. Be the donkey. I'm fine with that too. So this is, this is completely irrelevant. You can be the donkey, you can be a pig, you can be a cow, you can be a dog, I don't care. Eh? It doesn't make a difference. So, so will some people be paralyzed? Absolutely. Doesn't have to be everybody. Justin? So you take the proactive shares before the transaction? Exactly. Exactly. Because that's how you get a fair price. If you think about how we got the rational price in the Disney case or you know, all the practice problems, if it was a fair price, we took the change in value and we divided by the total number of shares outstanding. That was the logic. Everybody gets an equal share. So the amount of shares that the number of shares you go back and Doesn't matter. You can use it to check your answer if you want. I just yeah. like a really circular yeah. the, Otherwise, you get into the circle of logic, right? Because you don't know how many shares will be outstanding. That's what you're solving for. Right, the fair price actually, I, get, I told you the fair price, right? I, in fact, I told you the increase in value. Yeah, yeah, so if you get the increase in value, you got the fair price. And whatever the old price is plus the, the increase in price. That will be the fair price. So I gave you the fair price and you had to work backwards to, hey, what was it? The, the only difference between this problem and the previous quizzes was in the previous quizzes, I gave you the old cost of capital, the new cost of capital, and you solved for the fair price. In this quiz, I gave you the fair price and one cost of capital. It's an algebra problem. You're just working with one different unknown. And in the first problem, I know this confused you. There were two pre-tax costs of debt, right? How do you reconcile the fact that there are two pre-tax costs? Why is the pre-tax cost of debt in part A different from part B? You borrowed more money. The old guy lent you money at 4% because you had a certain amount of debt. Now you go out and borrow money. The new debt is not going to come in at that old cost. And guess what? The cost of all debt goes up. So all you need to do to, for part B is use a 5% cost of debt. No need to do weighted averages, nothing of that sort, because the old debt is not going to stay at 4%. That guy is not dumb. So basically, the cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money today. Never mind, let's do now, let's move on. Let's go, question? Somebody back there had a question? No. Yes? How did I define the long-term cost of debt? What did I define the cost of debt as? The rate at which you can borrow money long-term today. You can freeze the old debt at 4%. And you'll be happy about freezing it, but it doesn't mean your cost of debt stays at 4% the market value of that debt will drop. Because that guy is going to say, I face more default risk, I've got to adjust for it. So the cost of debt will always have to adjust to whatever risk you took on. And that's what the new debt ratio brings in. Yes? Uh, question about fair price. You don't. That's why you have to make a guess, right? That's why when I make an offer, you have to decide, because each person, it's not even that you don't know, but each of us could have a different firm value ca calculation. Those of you who calculate a much bigger increase in firm value will not sell your shares back. There might be others who say there'll be no change in firm value, they'll sell their shares back. So the, the, value, the, the fair price we've computed is based on the value change given the cost of capital. Each investor will have to make a decision as to whether that number is too high or too low. If you think it's too high, then you're going to sell your shares back. If you think it's too low, you're going to hold on to the shares. This is that break-even price at which you're indifferent. Yes? Did you say that for the cost of capital, the first question you have to change the cost of debt to the cost of charge? To what? have you borrowed at? Remember, in the second part, I told you you borrowed money at the different cost of debt in the first part, right? 
You can't leave it at the old cost of debt, otherwise you'll keep borrowing money like crazy. So let's talk about dividends. I don't know how many of you are, yes, go ahead. What do I mean by special dividend? Okay, somebody help me out. I didn't give you a buyback. I just threw in a variant, special dividend. What does a special dividend do? So it just increased your debt, but didn't decrease your, like your equity, right? Yeah. 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 What does a dividend do? It reduces, it has exactly the same effect as a buyback. The difference between a dividend and a buyback is a buyback reduces the number of shares and keeps the price high. The dividend reduces the price and keeps the number of shares the same. But the value of equity will decrease, right, by the amount of the dividend. Otherwise, again, it looks like it's a, it's you're having your cake and eating it too, right? So a special dividend is exactly the same effects as a stock buyback. Yeah. It, ha it absolutely will. What do you think a special dividend is? Otherwise, I'll make money hand over fist, right? Because on the day of the dividend, what has to happen to your market value of equity to prevent arbitrage? It has to drop by roughly the amount of the dividend. So it's, it's a given. Once the dividend has been announced, all information is out there. It's not an information effect. It's purely to prevent people from making money by just buying the shares. And we're going to talk about this today, just before the ex-dividend day and making money on the ex-dividend day. So let's talk about div yes. In that case, what will happen is the number of shares will stay the same, right? The difference will be that your value per share will go up, and then you have to reduce it by the amount of the dividend. So what you will have then in your pocket is cash from the dividend. Exactly. The value effect will not change. It's how it will manifest itself for you as an investor will be different depending on dividends versus buybacks. Okay. Yes? I mean, what did I say? You have to be indifferent. Let's say I bought back at the current price. You help me out here. So you sell your shares back at the current price. What do the rest of the people get? You actually solved in your problem for the value per share for the remaining stockholders, right? You got a value well above the current price. Would you be indifferent between selling and not selling then? There's, there's my answer. That's, that's why I put that up. And it's how I, was, I wasn't trying to dance around. Because if I were more specific than that, I would essentially have given away the solution, right? So when I said indifferent, that's what I wanted to think about. Would I be equally happy selling my shares back or staying on? And the answer is basically, I have to get roughly the same amount of money both ways. Otherwise, I'm going to go jump one side or the other. But no, no, it's not the buyback that causes the increase. What is it that causes the increase? The fact that you move to your optimal and that your cost of capital decreased. So I would have got that even with the special dividend. That's why I said this is independent of whether I bought back the shares. It's coming entirely from the drop in the cost of capital. So I don't know how many of you are, I know a lot of you are in the capital structure section. Any of you on the dividend section of your project yet? OK, this will be a good time for me to remind you that your project is due two weeks from today. Oh, come on. I've been saying this word every session for the last 13 weeks. Now you moan and say, oh my god, this came on me unexpectedly? You're like my publishers. Year-end adjustment. This is like a semester-end shock. It is coming. Okay? So what I'd like you to do when you get to the dividend section is look to see whether your company pays lots of dividends or very little. And that's what I want to start the session with. I want to look at two measures you can use for how much a company pays in dividends. The first is called the dividend payout ratio. The dividend payout ratio looks at dividends as a percentage of net income. The second is called the dividend yield, which is dividends as a percentage of the stock price. Each measures something different. They're obviously correlated. When one is high, the other will tend to be high. But they're trying to measure something different. Let me start with the payout ratio. The payout ratio basically is dividends divided by net income, right? You're saying, what's a high number? Let me show you a distribution. This is actually the distribution for dividend payout ratios for dividend paying companies in the US and globally at the start of 2016. So I took the dividends in 2015 and divided by net income in 2015 to come up with the payout ratio. 
Among the companies that pay dividends in the US, the median payout ratio is about 35 to 40%. So if you told me your company has a payout ratio of about 35 to 40%, I'd say that's roughly where the typical company falls. That's not what you see as my median payout ratio up in that table, right? Just remember what I just said. I said among the companies that pay dividends, the median payout ratio is about 35 to 40%. There were 8,000 US companies in my sample. 3,500 of them paid no dividends. So that's why when you look across all US companies, the median is actually much lower. But among the companies that pay dividends, the median payout ratio is 35 to 40%. And you can see the payout ratio of 60, 70, 80%. You're at really high payout ratios. But I want to focus in on what seems like a very puzzling group. See that? More than 100%. That's not a small number. 15% of all US companies and 14% of companies globally had dividend payout ratios that exceeded 100%. Their first reaction is, these companies must be crazy. That could be true, but let's think of good reasons why a company might pay out more than its earnings as dividends. One is you're a REIT, explain, why would a REIT or a master limited partnership pay out more than its earnings as dividends? Because you're required by structure to pay more than its dividends. You have a, part of the structure, do you know how a REIT is structured? Basically, you don't have to pay taxes if you're a REIT, so that's your advantage. But in return for giving you that advantage, you're required to pay out 90, 95% of your earnings as dividends. But not more than 100%. The reason some of them tip over is real estate companies also tend to have big dividends, which push up their cash flows. So if you're a REIT or an MLP, you might pay out more than 100% of your earnings as dividends. What else? You're going out of, or not even going out of business. You're a company in a bad business. Remember we talked about life cycles? Life cycle, last stage of the life cycle, you're a declining company. You're shrinking businesses. One way you can respond to a shrinking business is by paying out more than your earnings as dividends year after year. You're, in a sense, liquidating yourself over time, making yourself a smaller company. That makes sense. What's the third group? This actually is a very, right now is a big, big group. Way too much cash may be accumulated from previous years, but that's again a life cycle issue, right? Because you're finally waking up and saying, oh my God, I need all this cash. So let's put that in the second one. There's a third group of companies that are being. I'm actually not even counting preferred dividends here. This is pure common dividends. So this preferred dividends are not even in, in this, because the payout ratios are computed using common dividends and net income. Preferred dividends are not even counted in. What did I describe dividends as sticky, right? If you're a commodity or a cyclical, cyclical company, think of what's going to happen. And you hope that the cycle comes back, commodity prices come back. So a lot of oil companies right now that are paying dividends are paying out more than 100%, hoping and praying that oil prices go back to 55 or $60 a barrel. So again, what I'm saying is when you do this for your company and you get a payout ratio greater than 100%, don't freak out. It's okay. There might be a good explanation. There might not. But first look at the good explanations before you jump to the conclusion, my company is crazy. Any questions on payout ratio? Sometimes when you look up the payout ratio for a company, it'll say not meaningful, even though the company pays dividends. When does that happen? What's in the denominator? Net income, right? What happens when net income becomes negative? You can't take dividends and divide by a negative number and tell me, am I, so when net income becomes negative, your payout ratio becomes not meaningful. So that's a payout ratio. Let's talk about dividend yield. What is the dividend yield measure? The dividend yield measures a portion of your returns on a stock that comes from dividends. The rest has to come from price appreciation. The median dividend yield across US companies last year was about one and a half to two percent, which means when you're looking for returns on the stock, don't expect dividends to bail you out. Dividends are a very small portion of your returns. Global stocks, it's slightly higher, 2.5%. Two, two right? But again, I want to focus on a subset of stocks here that look too good to be true and are actually too good to be true. See stocks with dividend yields of 5, 5.5, 6, 6. And that sounds incredibly good, right? Why? The T-bond rate right now is, what, 1.8%. You buy a triple A corporate bond, you're going to make two and a half to three percent. Even a triple B bond, you're getting four and a half to five percent. Here I am offering you six and a half percent on a stock. 
And in fact, there are investment strategies built around buying these really high dividend yield stocks. Might work, but what are the dangers of investing in that stock? And so that might be the first thing. It's a liquidating dividend, which means your stock price will decrease over time. In fact, have you heard of yield codes? Yield codes are what brought Sun Edison down last week. And yield codes, what you do as an energy company is you take your biggest cash flow generating assets, you strip them out, and you issue shares against those assets. Those yield codes have finite lives, which means that they last as long as the plant you're, you're issuing the shares against lasts. So over 25 years, they can actually pay 6% dividends, but at the end of the 25th year, there's going to be nothing. You're saying as opposed to what? As opposed to buying a 4% coupon bond where you get 4% every year for the next 25 years, at the end of the 25th year, you get the entire face value. So the first danger is that, that you might be getting a liquidating dividend. It's really not a dividend. It's a dividend plus capital return. What else? When you get these really high dividend stocks. And which do you think causes these yields to increase? Make a guess. The share price going lower. Why did the share price go lower? Because bad things were happening to your company, right? And we talked about dividends being sticky. So if you're a bank in the middle of a scandal, the last thing that changes is your dividend. It's like the last outpost of sanity or insanity or whatever it is. Your stock price collapses. So basically, you think you're getting 7% dividends, but it might last one quarter before the whole thing flips over. A stock is not a bond. I shouldn't say that, but I'll say it anyway. A lot of people think when they buy shares they buy, and they get those dividends, they think of those like coupons. They think that somewhere there's a contractual agreement that the company is made to pay you the dividends. No, there's no such agreement, so today's dividends can be done, gone tomorrow. So when you look at your dividend deals, that's the other thing to check. So one other thing, if, what did I say? What, uh, now what, how many companies in the U.S. pay no dividends? 3,500, right? So odds are that at least 35% of the companies in this class that are being covered are paying no dividends. And you're going to be tempted, and I'm going to remove this temptation right now, to get to the dividend policy section and tell me the following. My company pays no dividends, therefore it has no dividend policy, so I'm skipping this section. Don't do it. Policy of paying no dividends is a dividend policy. You still have to explain to me whether that policy makes sense. So just because a company doesn't pay dividends, don't abandon this entire section and move on, because you still have to make the same judgments you do when a company does pay dividends. So let's start with this very simplistic structure we've used in analyzing the other in capital structure, investment policy, which is the life cycle. You tell me where your company is in the life cycle, I'll tell you what I'd expect to see in dividends. So you're a young startup, of course you shouldn't pay dividends. You'd be crazy to pay dividends. You're a young growth company, you shouldn't pay dividends. Why? Because even if you're making money, all that money plus more should be going back into the company to grow. So if you're Pandora, and I ask you how much should Pandora pay in dividends, the answer is absolutely nothing. As the growth company continues to mature and your earnings start to come in, your dividend capacity opens up. And remember when debt capacity opened up, what companies did? They went into denial. They said, we're not a mature company, we're still a growth company. So just like that, when dividend policy, when dividend capacity opens up, the first reaction companies have is, no, no, this can't be right, we're a growth company, it has to go away. But guess what, if you're a maturing company, that dividend capacity will start expanding and expanding. And the way it's going to manifest itself is the cash balances of these companies will go from 5 billion to 10 billion to 15 billion to 25 to 30. At some point in time, reality will strike you that this is not a temporary phenomenon, that this is not going to go away. If reality doesn't strike you, an activist investor will strike you saying, hey, you got a lot of cash, give me the cash back. So when you think about life cycles, you can think about where your company's in the life cycle, and as it matures, you should see paying more dividends. And then when it gets into decline, you should expect to see liquidating dividends, dividends that actually exceed what you can afford to pay out. I've used this expression before, but with dividend policy, you're looking for companies that don't act their age. Growth companies that pay no, you know, pay no dividends you expect, but growth companies that pay big dividends are behaving in a strange way, and mature companies that refuse to pay dividends are pay, you know, playing just as strange a game. Your job is to step in and say, that doesn't make sense. 
And just to back up this life cycle argument, I took every US company, I classified these companies into five groups, actually six, one to seven groups, based on expected growth in earnings for the next five years. So look at this x-axis. So 0 to 3% means that investors are expecting about 0 to 3%, less than 3% growth over the next five years, all the way to the other extreme, more than 25% growth. So low growth to high growth companies. I computed the payout ratio and dividend yield for companies within each group, and no surprises. Companies that have really low growth, 0 to 3%, have a payout ratio of about 45% and a dividend yield of about 3.7%. So the lowest growth companies pay out the most in dividends, and as growth decreases, you can see dividends start to drop off. So one thing you might consider doing for your five or six companies in your group is list them out in terms of growth, and then look at their dividend yields and payouts, and you should expect to see a correlation, at least a rough correlation between those two numbers. Any questions on life cycle? Yes, Roy. The axis, basically, this is expected growth in earnings over the next five years on the x-axis. The y-axis, th that y-axis is the payout ratio. This y-axis is the dividend yield. I don't know why the labels all disappeared. So the right y-axis is the yield. The left y-axis is the payout ratio. The bottom is the earnings growth over the next five years. Okay. So let me look at my, the numbers for my companies. For my five, for my five companies, is what the numbers look like. I'm reporting both the numbers in the most recent 12 months and over the previous five years. And I would recommend that you do the same for your company, and you're going to see very quickly why. For Disney and Tata Motors, what happened in the last 12 months is very similar to what happened over the last five years. The yield and payout is similar. But take a look at Vale. Vale, in the trailing 12 months leading into 2013, the dividend yield had climbed to 6.56%. They were paying 113% of earnings as dividends. Remember we talked about commodity companies hoping that things will bounce back? That's why they're saying, I know prices are going to go back up. They're going to go back up. You can see the dividends have stayed elevated. In fact, the only reason the, the yield went from 4% to 6.56 was not because they increased dividends, but because their stock prices had dropped, because the market said, hey, they're not going back up. And if you look at Deutsche, 1.96% dividend yield, 362% of their earnings as dividends. Banks are among the worst culprits when it comes to sticky dividends. For whatever reason, for 150 years, banks have felt that this urge to continue to pay dividends, even in the face of the worst possible news. And you see that reflect with Deutsche in terms of what they're paying on. So look at the yield and the payout ratio right now, but also take a look at what it was three years over the last three years, last some historical time period to get some perspective. So I'm going to lay the table in terms of how to think about dividends. And there are three schools of thoughts on dividends. And they kind of span the spectrum. It's very convenient. The first school of thought says, if you as an investor don't care whether you receive dividends or capital gains, in other words, you're indifferent in terms of taxes between the two, and companies can go out and raise equity whenever they need to without paying transactions costs, no investment banking fees, no flotation costs, it does not matter what you pay in dividends. Dividends are irrelevant. Does that sound familiar? About three weeks ago, two weeks ago, didn't we say that something else was irrelevant? Capital structure was irrelevant, and that was Miller Modigliani 1. This is Miller Modigliani 2. If you have no personal tax differences and you can raise equity at the drop of a hat, it doesn't matter how much you pay in dividends. If we lived in a Miller Modigliani world, this class would have ended about four weeks ago. No, seriously, after capital budgeting was done, it's it. You know, basically, capital structure doesn't matter. Dividend policy doesn't matter. So if that was your excuse for not preparing for quiz three, that was not a good excuse. Because we don't live in a Miller Modigliani world. So in the Miller Modigliani view of the world, and I'll come back and explain why this holds, it doesn't matter how much you pay in dividends. The second school of thought was, for, for the most part, created in the last part of the last century when taxes on dividends in the US were much higher than taxes on capital gains. And I'm going to show you the graph, and you're going to see how much higher. And it said, look, if you're going to be taxed at 60% on dividends and 25% on capital gains, you're crazy to pay out dividends because your investors get punished every time you get dividends. So this school of thought says don't pay dividends. And it's been around for a long time. So dividends don't matter. Dividends are bad, right? 
might as well round out the spectrum here. The third school of thought says if you have investors in your company who like dividends. You're saying, what kind of investor likes dividends? You tell me, what kinds of investors like dividends? And I'm going to throw some choices. Old or young? Poorer or richer? Poorer, older investors like dividends. Why don't richer investors like dividends? What are they going to do with the dividends anyway? Bill Gates is probably not waiting for the check in the mail, no check from Microsoft, I can't spend any money. You're worth $20 billion, who cares whether the dividend is in the mail or not in the mail? Older, poorer investors like dividends. Pension funds like dividends, why? In other words, they have cash flow, needs to be, what's the other? Is it even more fun? What, what taxes do pension funds pay? They pay no taxes. They don't pay dividends. Don't, don't be, start smirking. This is your pension fund money, your 401k. You don't have to pay taxes until you actually start to get the cash. So they tax you already. So don't feel sorry for the IRS. Oh my God, the poor IRS, the pension funds are not paying the money. Reserve your sympathy for somebody more deserving. They don't pay taxes because the tax guy says, I've already collected my taxes, I'll collect it later, don't worry. So pension funds like dividends, older and poorer investors like dividends, and those are the investors you have as a company, you should pay more dividends. Notice how convenient this is if you're a CFO. If you're a CFO and you want, want to cut dividends, what do you point to? The dividends are bad school. Okay? If you're a CFO and you want to increase dividends, you point to the dividends are good school. If you have no idea what you're doing with dividends, you say, I'm in the middle of Modigliani school. Your entire school of thought backing you up, no matter what you do. I'm going to kind of take all three schools, because there is some truth in all of them, and try to put them all in my view of dividends. So here's the way I think about dividends. You tell me whether you agree. If you're a company with lots of cash coming in from your businesses and very few good projects, then I think you should give back more cash to your investors. If you're a company with relatively little cash coming in and lots of projects, then you shouldn't be returning cash to your investors. It's as simple as that. So if I can somehow measure how much cash is coming in and what kind of projects you have, I should be able to pass judgment on how much you should pay in dividends. I'm going to get there and give you a way of doing that. Before I do that, I want to kind of look at the three schools of thought we talked about. Dividends don't matter, dividends are good, dividends are bad. Let's start with the dividends don't matter school. We create for you a hypothetical company. This company has 250 million in earnings. And based on its needs, it can afford to pay out $100 million in dividends. You're investors in this company. I'm in the Miller Modigliani world. I decide to pay out $200 million in dividends, twice what I can afford to. This is bad, right? But why doesn't it matter in the Miller Modigliani world? I've paid out too much in dividends, so what do I assume I can do? I can go out and raise 100 million, because there are no flotation costs and transaction costs, I can raise fresh equity at no cost. So the company can continue to do what it always did in terms of, but aren't you guys hurt? Well, I paid you more in dividends, twice as much dividends, so you get more dividends, but you also give up some price appreciation because I have to issue new shares now to cover the difference. What you get as a total return will remain the same, but you will get more of it in dividends, less of it in price appreciation. Now, normally investors worry about that because you pay different taxes on the two, but in the Miller Modigliani world, you pay exactly the same taxes on the two. You don't care. So in the Miller Modigliani world, the two building blocks for why dividends don't matter is the first is you as investors, because you pay the same taxes, don't care whether you get your 10% as 2% dividends and 8% price appreciation or 8% dividends and 2% price appreciation. And companies don't care because they can go out and raise more equity if they, if they pay out too much in dividends. And if they pay too little, they continue to take exactly the same projects they would have if they hadn't paid the dividend. It's easy to dismiss the Miller Modigliani theorem as kind of extreme, but it's a good way to think about when dividends don't matter. Is as tax laws change to make dividends and capital gains more similar for you, and companies' investment policy is decoupled from their dividends. If you have good projects, you take those projects. If you don't, you don't. Then dividend policy increasingly starts to matter less and less. So that's the dividends are don't matter school. 
Let's take the dividends a bad school. I'm going to, this graph looks incredibly confusing, but it goes back to 1916. The Supreme Court in 1916 did this awful thing. They said that the income tax at the federal level was constitutional. See why it's awful every April 15th. I burn an effigy of that Supreme Court somewhere. Because until then, you, you know, because until 1916, remember the, the nature of the US is states were the ones who could tax. You could not have an income tax at the federal level. So when the federal income tax was passed, it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you can tax. So that was the start of all our troubles. This graph actually shows you the tax rate on dividends, that's a purple line, and the tax rate on capital gains going back to 1916. 1916 through 1922, the taxes were the same on the two. Starting in 1922, take a look at the dividend tax rate versus the capital gains tax rate. Every single year, the dividend tax rate is lower than the capital gains tax rate. And look at the 1950s. What's the highest tax rate on dividends? 90%. So if, at this point, you're probably saying, why are you even mailing the dividend check to me? Just mail it to the IRS. It's like you're an intermediary. You don't collect the check, you mail it. You know. 90% on dividends. So you receive $100 in dividends, 90% goes to taxes. The highest tax rate on capital gains in the 1950s was 25%. Let me ask you an absurd question. Would you rather receive a dollar in dividends or a dollar in capital gains? The answer seems to be obvious. Of course, I'll take the capital gains. Now, two caveats. These are the highest tax rates. So who pays them? The wealthiest individuals, right? Now, it's possible if you make 25,000, 20,000, 15,000, these are not the tax. So if this were the tax rate for everybody, the dividends are bad school, of course they're right. You shouldn't be paying dividends. But that was the basis of their argument. The tax system is structured against dividends. Don't pay dividends. But the tax, taxation of dividends and capital gains is really messy. Not only are pension funds tax-free, but even your own wealth, if you look at your different portions of your portfolio, are taxed differently. Any of you have a Roth IRA? Okay. Actually, though, if you make earned income, you should create a Roth IRA with every dollar of earned income and borrow if you need to to live. And there's a simple reason. What's the advantage of a Roth IRA? And not only does it accumulate, but what does it accumulate as? It accumulates tax-free. In other words, you take your Roth IRA, you're allowed to put up to 50. This is free tax advice I'm offering. If you can take $5,500 and put it into a high dividend paying stock, the dividends you receive on that 55, the 5,500 has to come out of after-tax income, but the dividends you receive on the 5,500 are tax-free until you take it out when, until you're near 75. And at that point, you might even not, not even be paying taxes. So even within your investment portfolio, some of your money gets taxed at a high rate, some gets taxed at a lower rate. So here's where I'm going. If I to talk to a company and say, well, what kind of tax rate do your investors pay on dividends and capital gains? The answer is most companies have a really tough time answering that question. So I'm going to give you a way in which we might be able to estimate what investors in a company pay on dividends and capital gains. I talked a little bit about special dividends and ex-dividend days. Here's what I'm going to do. Let's assume we're all stockholders in a company. We bought shares five years ago, and the price we bought the shares at was P whatever that is, $3, $4, we bought the shares all five years ago. Tomorrow is going to be an ex-dividend day. There, there, when you think about dividends, there's the announcement day, where the dividends are changed and the board of directors announces. The ex-dividend day is the date by which you have to buy the stock to actually collect the dividend. So tomorrow is going to be an ex-dividend day, and the dividend is going to be D dollars. I know it's abstract, but think of that as the dividend. You have a choice, each of you has a choice between selling before the ex-dividend day, in which case you won't get the dividend, or selling after the dividend, ex-dividend day. You say, why would I be silly enough to sell before? Well, because the price the day before and the price the day after are not going to be the same. So here's what I want you to think about. Think about what you would make as cash flows if you sold before the ex-dividend day, and then let's ask what will, what will you get as cash flows if you sell after the ex-dividend day. 
So let's start with the before X dividend day. If you sell before the X dividend day, this is what you're going to get as cash flows. You're going to get PB, which is the price before the X dividend day. You'd have to pay capital gains taxes on the difference between that price and the price you originally paid, but you don't get a dividend. If you sell after the X dividend day, you're going to get PA, which is the price after the X dividend day. You're going to have to pay capital gains taxes on that price, plus you get the dividend net of the taxes you'd have paid on dividend. You're saying, where's this going? For this to be a stable market, you have to be indifferent between selling before and after. Why? Because if every one of us would make more cash flows from selling before than after, we're all going to sell the day before. If we all get higher cash flows from waiting after, none of us will sell before. So the point of indifference, the two cash flows have to be equal. And you've got to trust me on the algebra or go home and test it out. But if you work through the algebra, it turns out, that the change in the stock price on the X dividend day as a percentage of the dividend is going to be proportional to the difference between your ordinary tax rate, which is what you pay in dividends, and your capital gains tax rate. If I take a look at that equation, it's kind of blurred. Under what conditions will the, will the price drop be exactly equal to the dividend? What has to be true about your tax rate and dividends and capital gains? They have to be exactly the same. If they're exactly the same, the two will be equal. But if your tax rate on dividends is higher than the tax rate on capital gains, the price drop will be less than the dividend. If it's equal, then of course the, the two will be equal. And if the tax rate on capital gains is actually higher than dividends, which is true in some countries, you can actually get a price change on the ex-dividend day that is greater than the dividend. That's the opening I'm going to use. I'm going to go look at the ex-dividend day at your stock. If on the ex-dividend day, your price drop is consistently lower than the dividend. I'm going to conclude that investors in your company don't like dividends because of the way they're behaving. If it's equal, I'm going to assume investors are indifferent. And if the price drop is higher, I'm going to assume that your company is one of those companies where investors actually are taxed higher on capital gains than on dividends. And I have some statistics on this. If you go back, there are three studies I'm going to draw on. 1966 through 69, when the tax rate on dividends was 70% and capital gains was 28%. For every dollar paid in dividends, the stock price dropped only 78 cents. You go to 1981 through 85, when the tax difference had narrowed, every dollar in dividends, you get an 85, 85 cent drop in the stock price. Then 1986 through 90, when the tax rates actually converged, for every dollar in dividends, the stock price dropped. So basically, it's been rising over time. And I'm going to close with actually a strategy you can adopt maybe to make money. I mean, maybe you and I can't do it, but pension funds can if you're tax exempt. Let's assume on average the stock price drops only 90% of the dividend. If you're a pension fund, can you see a way in which you can make money, exploit this difference? What are you going to do? And I've given you some choices. You can invest in the stock for the long term. That's going to actually do nothing for you. You can sell short, but that's a little complex. But what if you bought shares just before the X dividend day and held them through the X dividend day? You earn the 10%. You earn the 10%. You see why you earn the 10%? Your stock price is going to drop 90 cents, but you're going to get a dollar in dividends. You're saying just 10, 10 cents. You're right, it's only 10 cents. Don't do it on one share. Do it on a million shares, or 10 million shares. That's called dividend capture or dividend arbitrage. It happens on big dividend paying stocks on the X dividend day. You'll see the big jump in volume. It's because the dividend paying stocks, you're getting this capture of dividends from tax exempt investors. Okay? So that's actually an example of what happens. You buy a million shares at $50. You lose you know, 900,000 because the stock price drops. But you get a million dividends. You get to keep 100,000. Final question, is this a guaranteed profit? What's the risk? It's the same risk you face when you stick your head in the oven and you feed in the freezer and you say, I'm at an average temperature. You are, right? It's really 150 degrees, 50 degrees. It's okay, it's only 100 degrees, but your head's getting roasted and your feet's frozen. This is an average amount, which means if you do this on a day on which the market's down 15%, I don't care what the average statistics look like. So when we start, we will continue with this discussion on what good reasons for paying dividends are, because we've looked at some bad, you know, some reasons why you might not want to.
Because at the, at the time of the issue, the book interest rate is equal to the market interest rate. Right? Because I'm issuing it at the fair. It's only afterwards that the two start to diverge, right? So at the time of issue, book interest rate is market interest rate. That's by definition. It's only afterwards that you get a divergence between the two numbers. Yeah? Yes? Walk up with me. Yeah. For number one, um, why is paying special dividends the same as buying the well, I don't get the dividend thing yet. So I'm not gonna... On the day the dividend was paid, stock prices would drop by the dividend. It's up to your equity value has to decrease by the amount of the dividend. Because it's not going to It has to, right? Otherwise, people would make money on that dividend based by just buying it. So almost by definition, you pay a special dividend and the stock prices would drop by the amount. Uh, so it would be exactly the same effect. Yeah. 